last year, in September, um, the government of St. Martin uh, was happy to partner with the USM in bringing to you this uh, lecture series, uh, all um, aiming to get a better understanding of the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development. Uh, this is the last series of the season, but we hope to continue uh, the next season with uh, another uh, series um, of interesting uh, topics. Okay, the, presenter of the pre presenters of uh, tonight's uh, lecture will be uh, focusing in defining linguistics, challenges encountered by uh, translators and interpreters. The topic of this evening are specifically mentioned in SDG Sustainable Development Goal so number four, quality of education. Uh, this goal is about ensuring inclusive and equitable quality education and promoting lifelong learning for all, for all. And there are some targets uh, for example, about uh, universal uh, primary education, secondary education, early childhood, and you name it. But the target number six of this SDG number four is about universal youth literacy. And when we, when we focus on literacy, uh, on this target, it is not only about, you will uh, see that it is not only about literacy, but also numeracy, okay? So um, our focus today, of course, is the literacy. And uh, that's why I want to focus a little bit on the gains, the benefits of uh, uh, multi being someone uh, who can speak several uh, languages. Um, why is it so important and what are the benefits? Um, be, uh, bilingualism um, can improve your compet competitiveness, oh, difficult words, in the job market. And uh, knowing a second language can open up your career opportunities. We all are aware of that, but we don't stand still on those. Bilingualism um, can earn more uh, sorry, uh, bilinguals can earn more money most of the time uh, with their jobs. And um, when you can speak several languages, you can you open up to social and um, other cultural, for example, col cultural uh, opportunities. Speaking another language gave you a view, a new perspective on several things. Speaking a second language can improve problem solving, multitasking, and decision making. Bilingualism can slow, I didn't know this one, can slow the effects of old age. Did you know that? Ah, I want to hear more about that. Okay, so there are quite some benefits in being able to speak more languages. What is language of instruction? Language of instruction is a language I use to teach, to teach, to pass on knowledge. On St. Martin, we have two languages. Two languages are used as language of instruction, English and Dutch. And each of them has its own following. We can almost call them fan clubs because you're either for Dutch or you're for English and both passionate. Now here comes the clue. I was a big fan of Dutch as language of instruction. And I found everything to, at that time, to justify it. But things change. And the thing with change is, once the ball starts rolling, it doesn't stop. Nobody can stop it. We were here on St. Martin with Dutch as language of instruction, American tourism, migrants from the English islands, American businesses, and English being, or St. Martin English being, the language we all understand. Now, 
When I realized that, and on St. Martin, we are faced with this change, and that caused me to reconsider and reflect. St. Martin has always had an issue with languages. Even in times of my parents, there was always a Dutch and an English. Do you know that St. Martin had a Dutch school up to the ninth grade? Why they didn't put a 10th grade? My mother-in-law was in the ninth grade with Miss Jenny the Weaver and all. They had the ninth grade. Then after that, they went back to the eighth grade. And the language of instruction was also Dutch. But it started off in English. English has always been a leg of the language of instruction. It was in kindergarten, and then it moved up to the first and second, and then it moved up to the third. Things start moving. And then they decided to have English as language of instruction. I have to jump because the years are going very fast. Why did it go to English? And why did we choose Dutch? We chose Dutch because Dutch was the official language of St. Martin. Nobody thought of whether the child going to understand what the teacher's saying or whether it made any sense. It was the official language, so language of instruction had to be Dutch. But like I said, things were changing. Could you imagine a child of five years, six years, coming to school, very enthusiastic, a very bright child, very alert, speaks English, St. Martin English, and when he comes to the class, all he's hearing is Chinese. Because that is what you hear when you don't understand a language. And that bright little child turns out to be not so bright, according to us. Because not because he's not bright, because he doesn't understand what you're saying. So language of instruction, what is the task of it? What is the task? You want to impart knowledge to your people. That's it. You want to impart knowledge. Now, if you want to impart knowledge, I got to understand what you're saying. I not only got to understand what you're saying, I should be able to answer you back and communicate with you. And I should, not, I should be able to understand the emotions that, that happens. And if you don't do that, you can't, you cannot, you miss so much. We have lost, and it is me talking after I've been converted. <laughs> we have lost so many bright brains because of language of instruction being Dutch. And it has nothing to do with whether you like Dutch or you don't like Dutch, or you like Dutch people, or you don't like Dutch people. It has nothing to do with it. We have to educate our people, and we have to choose the language that is closest to them. My, my observation has started around the age of 12 or 13, at a time when I had to listen to discussions around the dining room table uh, from a man who was my father, a politician, a diehard Saint Martiner, and his wife, who was a Guadeloupian, and I'm, I'm giving you the, all that detail so that you understand exactly where I'm coming from. She was a Guadeloupian, and she was a school teacher. And so, of course, the conversations always dealt with issues related to the country, related to the people, and the possible effects of the outcomes of all of these issues in the long run. So, as I, the translator or interpreter, attempt to, attempts to, you know, I attempt to understand what is happening when language is at the center of a lock on, on this island, I think I feel obliged to go back to what could be the beginning of our present reality. And I'm gonna ask you to bear with me, because I think it's necessary. In my daily practice as a translator and interpreter, attached to the Court of Appeal in Bastère, in Guadeloupe, which court has extramurals or extramural sessions at the court in Marigot, the, house, the courthouse in Marigot, um, the question I want to ask is, who is the person I have to assist as an interpreter? Why do I have to translate for that particular person? Especially if I know the person, especially if the person was born on the French side of St. Martin, 
especially if the person has been to school on, you know, on the French side of St. Martin. And when I see this, then it forces me to recognize that there's an issue, and the issue is not with the individual. The issue is probably with the system. As I look at the education system, it seems as if it has many, many deficiencies. And it has not worked in favor of the St. Martiners. It has worked against them. Why? Let's look at the history of colonialism for a minute. And I think it gives us a background of the education system in St. Martin, which is modeled after the French education system. And I'm emphasizing French education system. The speaker who spoke just before me said, language goes with a culture. This leads me to ask three questions. How does the French language education system affect St. Martin and its becoming a country with many languages, a country with English as its first language, a country with a mother tongue that is a deriv derivative of English? And if I go back to the French side, the northern side, the side I come from, <laughs> what is an alternative to using French education, and what are the various reactions that we would get from St. Martiners if we were to use another system? My last question would be, why has a mother tongue program, or at least a transitional bi- or multilingual education, never been indoctrinated? as the primary method of education. Especially when I heard Aldine just now, I'm like, I can reinforce what you just said, and I'm asking the question, why? We're in 2019, and still it seems not to be, you know, of any interest to anyone. Even though I will not attempt to answer these questions directly, trust me, as I ask them, there's no innocence behind them. I have an idea. I have an answer that I would wish to share, and I can share them with you, you know, uh, during the question and answers. French colonialism has left a legacy of imperialist rule. Not just here in St. Martin, huh, or in the Caribbean, but everywhere where it was manifested, you've got the exact same reality. Colonialism, we know, began in our region in the 15th century, and at that time, both the French and the English were competing to control the islands, or at least competing all, to control all the territories that they were trying to invade. And of course, you know how the story ended on St. Martin on the 23rd of uh, March, 1648. We make a big hoopla about that. But on that day, a slow takeover began. And as such, it took on many forms. For instance, it determined new borders. And as an international law specialist, the issue of borders is one that I have great interest in. New borders mean that perhaps the borders were different from the ones that we know today. And if they were different, perhaps they entailed other realities. Perhaps the border of French side, Dutch side, one side has Dutch as, a national, uh, as its official language, and the other one has French as its, as, its, as its official language, was a reality that has been imposed to something that was completely different. Perhaps back then, the borders of the island, if there was such, any such thing, um, were borders that allowed English to be the most spoken language. Perhaps borders went further than just the borders, the physical borders or the physical shores of the island. Maybe it was a regional basin. Maybe it was a neighborhood. It was a group of islands. Perhaps, I'm just asking questions. I'm here to stir trouble. I like doing that. Um, colonialism functions for the purpose of increasing world power and wealth. And so French colonialism did just that. It didn't care about our development, your development, or mine. It simply cared about increasing power for France and adding wealth to France. In other words, 
Colonialism was advantageous to France's goal or goals of cultural imperialism to model the political system after the French system and to push the French language and the French cultural, uh, culture agenda, especially in schools where French teachers could easily influence the children that the French way was the best way. The consequence of this was an alienation, alienation, sorry, of St. Martin's. In order to assimilate them into the French culture and into the French value system. Now, I read an article that was written by uh, Dr. Ibrahima Diallo, a doctor of philosophy, I think he's Senegalese, um, and he says something that gives me the impression that in Senegal, which was a former French colony, this situation was identical. So the alienation that occurred for students, St. Martin students in this particular case, into what I would call an identity struggle. St. Martiners at home that they could be, and as such, they could speak English. But they were expected to be French in school, and as such, they were supposed to be French. So one can therefore safely say that the French education system influenced the St. Martiners with physical actions, such as forming a system of governance, and I could talk about this as well at length, and setting up an education system, but also with verbal actions, which I refer to as a discourse, which aided the French in creating a state of imperialistic control in St. Martin. Perhaps I should define discourse. As I will go on, using this word, because I might use it, you know, I think I'm gonna use it several times. And I would say that um, discourse for me is a system of meaningful relations that are established by social construction. In other words, they're things that we end up adhering to to give significance to the things that we do. Not necessarily because that's what we are. As such, discourse will shape attitudes towards politics. It would shape attitudes towards systems. For instance, it would offer an explanation uh, for the existence of a particular system, and it would get us, the public opinion, to validate it, to support it. So discourse is instrumental in changing St. Martin's to become less Caribbean and more French, to convince St. To convince Martin's that their way of life, had it been Caribbean, would have been far inferior to the French way of life. And in this way, if there was once a St. Martin identity, it was tarnished. Some of you, if you know me very well, you probably heard this conversation before, but I think it is worth repeating because um, a lot of what Alex said, and I want to just make that a point tonight, with regards to the French, <laughs> is identically the same for the Dutch on this side of the island. The only difference so far has been their approach during and after slavery, and still during this period of colonialism. People don't like to hear the word, but it's the reality of what's going on. And you see it manifest in just about every aspect, especially now since Irma. It's, it's, it's scary. Give me the heebie-jeebies. Um, and I want to say this because um, when I, I was a problem child at MPC, and, and, I, and I don't use the word problem in the way that we use today to describe um, so-called difficult children, but Miss Oldin said pretty much, I think, I don't know if you had me or you were around when I well, came on, but um, you didn't ha I know you didn't have me as a student, but you were around, but the people at MPC gave me a hard time and I, and I reciprocated. Um, and a lot of that I found out later on as I started to engage in my studies had like, everything to do with language, absolutely everything to do with language, because um, I don't think I was a rude child. My mother didn't raise me that way, and I couldn't dare to be rude. But as a student in the school system, I couldn't defend myself with my language, and it brought out not always the best in me. And I remember I, I told this story once. My answer to everybody, especially the Dutch teachers that would use these big words to, to label you when they didn't understand you, my only answer was like your mother. And I used to take care of everything. 
Um, so that would get me in a lot of trouble. I say this because um, I did HAVO, and, and, and actually I passed something with HAVO Vebeo, and, and in those days, everybody, I think they still do think it was a great thing. My mother coming from St. Vincent with sixth grade education didn't understand half of what a big deal was about. So she was like, nope, you ain't going, you're too young. Because in those days, you had to go to Curacao to do the Vebeo story. And my mother said, nope, you ain't going nowhere, you're too young. And I absolutely thank her for doing that because I don't know how my life would have turned out. But um, getting into the so-called Havo, that was like a big thing. Havo was new. It was not too long established, and everybody was talking about how smart you had to be to get into Havo. I wasn't impressed, still not impressed, um, but I was in. I don't know how. I know now as a linguist that a lot of it had to do with the fact that I'm a student of language. I'm a language student. I, I pick up language faster than a lot of, and, and, not, and not necessarily one language over the other, but as a student, if those, the teachers in this room will know what I'm talking about. Different students learn differently. And some students are language gifted. And those that have that, it's not a special gift to St. Martin, it's just that some students are wired a little differently. And those students that are, tend to do better in a school like MPC and a lot of other schools in St. Martin, but like MPC in particular, and it had nothing to do with intelligence. It has absolutely nothing to do with intelligence. We still today repeat that story because there's some prestige attached to it. And so we, like Oldine said, we miss out on a lot of bright, brilliant students because we still walk around with this misconception about what a smart student is in St. Martin. So I'm telling the story of my situation as a Havel student. And when I left here, um, I don't even know how I got through it because I hardly ever went to school. Um, I hardly ever, I didn't like it. I didn't like MPC, I didn't like school, I didn't like the teachers, I didn't like a whole lot of stuff about it, but I went. And I figured the only way I could get out of St. Martin was to finish this thing so I could leave. And when I got to the University of Miami, my roommate who was from Saudi Arabia was in one of my English classes. And we would always, come home and compare our notes, you know? you know. And she was always getting better grades than me, and I couldn't get it. And, she, and I had a nine for half of English, you know? So I thought I was really smart. And I was like, you know, you know one day I said, but let me see, you can't even speak English. <laughs> she was like, <laughs> she's from Saudi Arabia. I said, how are you getting higher than me in English and you can't even speak English? And you know, my roommate who was from Saudi Arabia, was teaching me English, and English was my language. That was heartbreaking. But that wasn't the, the, the hard part. The hardest part was I was in a class, my first semester, bad idea, no advisor in those days, but I picked a class called Philosophy of Life. <laughs> Wrong class to take if you can't speak, if you can't defend yourself with language. And I had a teacher, an instructor, professor, whatever, if you see him, you could see Napoleon reincarnate. If you see the picture of Napoleon, you could see this guy that I'm talking about. I swear to God, I'm not making this up. Um, and he had this little stomach and the pants were like up here. So, you know, he was a sight to behold when I would sit in the front. And there were three of us that were black in the class. This was like a class of about 50 or 60. Those classes were small classes, philosophy of life classes were really small. Not even 50, I think there was less than 50. Could have been about 30 of us in the class. But there were three blacks. There were two black boys and there was me. You know, this strange thing from the Caribbean with these braids. In those days, braids were brand new to him. It was a big thing coming in. And here I was in a class with James and Byron. James was the guy that you would see if you watched, um, what's that show with um, JJ? Good times, there you go. James was, was, was JJ in a, in a lighter version, but James was exactly JJ. And so he was a comedian of the class. And people were always laughing at James. But half the time I felt sorry for James. I felt they were most of the time laughing at James. But James was the clown of the class. And then there was Byron, who was a football player, University of Miami, my first school. Byron looked like the character in the Archie comic, Moose. Black guy, but light-skinned brother, but he was big. 
And so by definition, if he was an athlete and he was big and he was muscular, he was dumb. That was just the definition of, of it then. And then there was me, a black woman from the Caribbean with braids, you know, by definition dumb. And we had this class where the professor would constantly say these racist things. And half the times I wanted to respond, and I couldn't. And I would go home and I would cry at night. I would just cry. Because I know he was wrong about things he would say. And half of the things were racist, the other things were real, you know, philosophical things that I wanted to contribute to in the classroom. And I couldn't. And it's not because I didn't understand English. English was my language, I was from St. Martin. And I, but my school had not taught me my language to defend myself in my language. Um, Alex said it right. You got this alienation between the school language and the home language, and so they never complemented each other. And this is what we do to our children in St. Martin when we give them English and French as language of instructions. You don't understand how serious this thing is and how, why I am so passionate about what I do in linguistics and the reason why my book, Language, Culture, and Identity, because we touched on everything here tonight already. Um, culture and identity are not separated from what we do with language in the classroom. Absolutely not. <laughs>